I'm Jeff Wright, and welcome to the Plain to Fame podcast. As an entrepreneur, I have not only built an extremely successful business from scratch, but also employed thousands of men and women and helped them on their path to financial freedom. One of the most common themes for me and everyone else who has succeeded is that we never blame anyone and are aware that our success or failures fall solely on our shoulders. It was not until I hit rock bottom that I realized that only I alone could change my future. And on my podcast, you're going to hear the stories of successful folks who have gone from blame to fame in their own lives. I look forward to sharing my journey and great guests that will educate you about their path to success. Please join me each week on the Blame to Fame podcast. I'm Jeff Wright, and welcome to Blame the Fame, where we want to show you how to take all the blame that you have in your life to burn as fuel to take you to the next level. And I'm so excited today. From New York City, we have Mr. Chuck Garcia. Chuck is a 25-year-old. No, he's not 25 years old. He's a 25-year veteran. <laughs> in my mind, I am. <laughs> he's a 25-year veteran on Wall Street. Spent 14 years as a top executive at Bloomberg. He is currently on the staff at Columbia University. He is also an executive coach and best-selling author of his book, A Climb to the Top. Chuck, what an honor to have you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Always great to collaborate with you, and I'm delighted to be here today. So A Climb to the Top. I know that you're 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 a mountain climber. You're 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 a mountain man. Was that the inspir? It was obviously the inspiration for your book. But you know, I find um, a lot of people their own limited self beliefs is what keeps them from getting to the top and letting their past dictate to what their future is. Is is that what you're teaching? Yeah, let, let, let me begin with a quote I use often because you're spot on. Carl Jung, the great psychologist, put out into the universe as he treated his patients for whatever psychological issue they had maybe been dealing with. And it goes like this. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And that's a very powerful insight. And in that his point is no matter where you are, what you've done, I appreciate there may be a lot of things that may prohibit you people from doing anything. But his point is, and I really pick up on that in what I do for a living, is that so many people, which is why I love the title of, or at least the theme of, you can blame people all you want, but there's only one person who's in that driver's seat, and that's you. And what I do as an executive coach to my Wall Street clients and to my Columbia students, it's not that I come into class or into my coaching sessions teaching them how to communicate. Now, that's what I do. But that is just symptomatic of what I really do, which is trying to get beyond the layers of that and helping them to come to terms with what is holding them back from ascending to the top. So when, as a mountaineer, I've climbed a lot of mountains and I'm blessed for that but it was my second mountain expedition on Mount Kilimanjaro. And this was 20 years ago at the advent of my mountaineering um, experience. I remember when we were ascending the mountain and getting to the top of Kilimanjaro, we had a team of 13 people and 36 porters. It was an immense logistical consideration. That's an expedition, man. It was. Well, all of these are expeditions because when you climb a mountain, you do not do it alone. You do it in the service of other people who are there in the service of you to help you get to the top. But it became clear to me, Jeff, when we were descending after the joy of getting to the top of that mountain with this crew is massive. We moved tents. We, we elevated every single day. We were on another part of the mountain. And after five and a half days of stepping up onto that summit, it was glorious. But the aha moment came to me as on our second day of our descent, I looked up at that mountain. I then looked at the team that helped me and my mates, another 12 people, get up and down. And I said, my goodness, this felt like my career. As I thought about how did I climb my mountains? 
not because of my brilliance and climbing Kilimanjaro wasn't because of my technical competence. It was the skill, you have that. It was the will, but more important, it was being surrounded by generous people who were there in the service of my success. And so I thought about that, my goodness, what I just did, that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor for how I climbed at Bloomberg, for how I climbed at BlackRock. All of that was on display. So when I decided to write my book, which is based on a framework that I developed over years of public speaking. It's called the 10 Commandments of Great Communicators. And what I did is I cataloged what all, everybody told me, Chuck, you do this really well and you do this and you do that. When I started public speaking, I was untrained. I was self-taught. I didn't know exactly what I did. But Jeff, when I had the opportunity to reflect on those mountains, it's like, how am I going to put my work into the universe in the service of others? It became pretty clear. I'm going to use mountaineering as a metaphor for how we climb our mountains. But the backpack, it's not a briefcase or an iPhone. It's crampons, ice axe, food, water. It's tools. But in the communication, a variety of communication tactics that are in your backpack as you climb the mountain felt natural. It was a breeze to write. I just wrote what I knew, but it's me, the mountaineer climbing the career, the mountaineer climbing the mountain, but all of it in the service of others. That's what we do. We help others climb their proverbial mountains. And that's the key, isn't it? You have to surround yourself with people that, that share the same vision with you. People that are either at, have been either at or above the levels where you wanted to you wanted to go. Somebody was telling me the other day at dinner, they had a friend of our, a friend of theirs that was self-made. I said, there's never in the history of earth has there ever been anyone that's been self-made. No somebody problem. got help from somebody. They, you know, they had a mentor, somebody extended kindness to them. So, somebody, some, somebody somewhere helped anybody and in, in, anybody that's ever lived. I couldn't agree more. In fact, yeah, you know, I thought about early on in my career when I started recruiting, I was at Bloomberg and Mike Bloomberg once said to me, it was years ago, he said, I need you to hire 150 people. You got nine months to do it. I said, all right, we need, it was, it was just at the advent before Bloomberg just burst into becoming this juggernaut. And the first thing I thought about it, I took advice from Mike's playbook. Now, Mike is the smartest guy I've ever met, no question. So it's hard for him to say, hire someone smarter than him. Okay, but I'm the dumbest guy in the room. I was a really good student, but I was surrounded by a lot more brilliant people than me, which means I had to outsmart the world in my own way. I wasn't going to do it on any kind of brilliance. But the one thing I did learn when I started to recruit for people to work in, in the organization that I represented, I got to hire people smarter than me. The stupidest thing that I could ever do was hire someone that's not capable someone no. that doesn't align their values, their, their actions and their words. So what we really look for is the values, the, the skill is, is, the skill is important, but you can build on skills and you can teach people to do a lot of things. The will to be persistent, to have the creativity to, and, and, and the courage to make mistakes. And if you can find people like that, that's smart to me. It's not formulas and memorization. Smart is the perseverance, the one who uses the intuition when the storm comes on a mountain. What do I do? There's no playbook for this. Well, you take a deep breath. You get the smartest minds together, not the most intelligent, the smartest. Mm -hmm. All those, you get them together. Because there is a difference. There is a big difference. And you collaborate, but ultimately someone's got to make the call. Whenever I made the call, any leadership call, I always brought people in. I wanted their opinions. I wanted them to know they had a voice, but I got to make the call. So I got to be held accountable for it. But if I take that good advice, that is how you climb your mountain. And in no way, I agree with you hundred percent. Nobody is self-made, not Steve Jobs, not Bill Gates. You talk to anybody, they will tell you how much love, generosity, kindness, and somebody Always, I can point to it myself, somebody who inspired me to dream beyond my own limits and then to behave accordingly. That's what good mentors do. The other uh, last week, I had, was at a conference in South Carolina, and I had dinner with G General Larry Spencer, who is a uh -oh. retired four-star Air Force general. Indeed. And he's what you call a maverick. He... he enlisted in the Air Force, he has held every rank. Just an extraordinary, extraordinary individual.
climb to the and, top. And, and the fact that, you know, things were tough for him because he's African American. And back then, you, you know, things didn't things happen being as they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he had a hard time, yeah. but when you talk to people like that, people that, that have climbed their way to the top, if you take nothing else from them, uh, if, if they, if they talk totally above your head, which, which he talks above most people's heads, <laughs> right. uh, we'll, 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 we'll forgive him for that. Cause yeah. he's such a cool guy. <laughs> he is a very cool guy, but you walk away from that. If nothing else, wanting to be a better person, yeah. wanting to, wanting to, to excel and, and, and do things at the level that, that, that he did. A friend of mine told me a long time ago, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Oh my, I could not agree. Because you're not going to, you're not going to learn very much just listening to yourself. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Sometimes I just need to shut up and listen to someone who's got some good sage advice for me and to, and, and to execute on what they're telling. <laughs> do, do you know General Spencer? I don't, but I grew up in the military. My dad was a professor of linguistics at the United States Military Academy in West Point. He was a okay. civilian professor, but I grew up on the point. I grew up surrounded by soldiers and all my friends' dads were colonels and generals. And so I very much lived in that world. I sold hot dogs at a place called Mikey Stadium where the cadets play football against the, the they do. So I grew up in a military environment, but my home was a civilian. My dad was a, a scholar, of, of a language scholar. But when you grow up in the army, you grow, which I feel like I do, I was bicultural, so to speak. Sure. Civilian household, but I walked out of my house. It was yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. It was all army all the time. So for, for Larry Spencer, when I look at in my own life, who do I admire? The, 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 the service aspect of, of these guys do what they do. So guys like you and I have the freedom to do what we want to do. Absolutely. And we see that play out in Eastern Europe now, the courage of defending and serving your country. And so I don't know Larry Spencer, but I can't help but note who are the Army, Air Force, Marine generals that are out there doing really cool things and leading people, not necessarily on the battlefield, but in, in right now we are in a peaceful time, so to speak, if, if we can call it that. Those generals sure. are even more important when their their charges are retooling, rethinking. They look to guys like him for inspiration. That's what I love about him. He's an inspiring individual. One of the things that that one of the, his favorite things to say is something that he said that really drove him because he was he was really big in the athletics he was big in the football yeah. and and he said that his father really drove this home to him it's okay to fail yeah. but it's never okay not to try Oh, I agree. In fact, I think about every mountain climbing expedition and even in my own career. The one thing I can give myself credit for if I just had to is having the courage to screw up, to try something new. But also as a mountaineer, you're always taking that next step and you're not exactly sure where it's going to lead. So there's a bit of a risk taker in, in, in that, which is a good thing. I think so many, and I'll, I'll even say so many of my students, they're so afraid of social judgment. They're often afraid of doing anything. So, so no action is good because nobody can yeah. accuse you of screwing up. I, I, I completely flip the model. I would rather see you strike out 10 times than never get up to the plate. And, and Jeff, unfortunately, as we started this program, your point that many people, they, I, I don't want to say they put limitations on themselves. When the limitations occur, some work harder than others to try to remove the barriers. And those are the ones that have the courage to make the mistakes. Because when you're career climbing, mountain climbing, you're a scientist, you got to get a lot of things wrong before yeah. you do something right. And to your point, Jeff, many people don't have the courage to do it. It's guys like Larry that inspire others when they hear those words from the imminently incredibly successful who's saying I'm I include myself I certainly experience is a name I give to my mistakes I encourage people to go out there and screw it up not ethically you cannot make an ethical violation 
but right. you got you got you got something you want to try a new process. What? Give it a shot. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You adjust. Adapt. You might lose a little time. You might lose a little money, but but you know it, it's it's. But the big thing is that you learn and you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Um, it, you know it's funny because b- before the show we were talking about uh, my daughter, my little four year old grandson, yeah. and you know he he is just gregarious fearless he has already broken one leg both arms collarbone he'll he'll jump out of a tree he'll do anything (laughs) probably jump out of a plane one day with a parachute (laughs) probably will but you know what saddens me though is pretty soon he's gonna go to school yeah he's in school now yeah and what saddens me is they're gonna tell him to shut up indeed to don't do this don't do that you know, his friends are going to be around him. I mean, you know, we, this happened to all of us like, Hey, don't, don't raise your hand. If you don't, you know, you don't want to look stupid in front of everyone else that gets instilled in kids. And, and as it progresses on, you know, as life progresses on and we get older, it just gets worse. No one wants to be called on. No one, no one wants to look foolish. And I say that, you can't be successful at anything if you're not willing to look foolish. Well, unfortunately, I think one of the most popular TED Talks out there is by a guy named Ken Robinson. And what Ken talked about, he's an professional educator. What he talked about is schools kill creativity. And in the cram exam regurgitate model, what a ridiculous model it is that we define success by cramming and examining and then spitting back and regurgitating what you had so you get a 98 on an exam and everybody pats you on the back for being valedictorian. Unfortunately, those are my students. That's what they have been told. And in my opinion, they've been sold a bill of goods because what happens when you build the bridge from how we define academic success, which unfortunately your grandson's creativity is going to be killed because he is going to be put in a lane where that is not permissible. Here's the template. Make sure your font is size 12 and it's an Ariel and it's bold. And if you do all of that, you get a hundred. But God forbid, if you put anything creative on the front of that paper, you're not following the rules and you get stifled. So I agree. Part of why I teach at Columbia and what drives me, and I'm so glad I do. And and I know it it, it, to me, it's a calling. I, I work so hard and I walk into class and I completely flip the model. In fact, usually in my first set of classes, I throw up three rules up on the board. And I do it very silently and I do it in body language, but I click my PowerPoint and the first thing that goes up, so we have three rules in this class, three rules only. Number one, don't be afraid to make mistakes, be afraid of not learning from them. And then I pause for dramatic effect. I click the button and up on the PowerPoint with a mountain climber. Number two, strive for progress, not perfection. Pause. I hit number three. There is no failure in this class. There is only feedback. Now, the students think I'm leading them into a crevasse. They, they, I, I can see them getting anxious when they don't know me. Like, oh, my God. Like, what? what Some may be going, hey, well, I can go smoke some weed today because, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, he's not going to care. Dr. Garcia is going to give me an A either way. <laughs> you know, they may think that. But what I try to do is to bring the reality of I hear, I'm proud to represent an academic institution. I, it's in my DNA. I'm really glad to be here. And I am here in the service of you and your success. But what I can say is that how you define success in this institution is going to be colossally different when you go to Goldman Sachs and Google and all these other places and they give you a job responsibility. What I am certain of is your cram exam, the formulas that you memorize, the facts and figures you, you work so endlessly to put into your head. If there's anything in the world that you can Google, that means you don't need to study it. So what do you do? Create the thing that hasn't been invented. That's what I want you to do. And if you do that, you will bring immense value to your company. If you are proud of your cram exam and your GPA, that is insignificant and will never be discussed. It takes them a while to get it, but <laughs> eventually they do because I bring my students who graduated back and they all talk, oh man, Chuck was so right. Gee, let me tell you a story. Like, all right, now we're getting somewhere. It's funny you say that because I, I went to a high school reunion. Uh, it was like my 30 year high school reunion. 
and all the overachievers, the ones, the ones that got the A's, uh, the, the ones that, that made the Dean's list were in the right clubs. I was not in any of those. By the way. <laughs> right. I, was I, was, terrible, I was in I was, your club. <laughs> I was, I was a terrible student, but most of these people, uh, are not what I would call to be successful today. Yeah. Most of them are, you know, the guys that skip school, that, that instead of going to history class, they cut class and went fishing and drinking and all that stuff. These are the guys making all the money. Well, interestingly enough, Jeff, one of the books I use in my class was written by a Harvard professor named Clay Christensen. He passed away last year, but he's best known for being the author of a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. He graduated from Harvard Business School and for his 25th reunion, Jeff, and it's the same story, he recounted before they got together for their reunion, thinking about at the graduation 25 years earlier, these are the masters of the universe. They were all going to go out there and change the world. When they got together for the reunion, he was completely shocked at what he saw. Two of his classmates were in jail. One of them was Jeff Skilling from Enron. Wow. Many, of the, right, many of his other classmates were divorced, estranged from their children, otherwise leading miserable lives. And what he thought about, which gave birth to a wonderful book called How Will You Measure Your Life? What he said is for all those things in the great expectation we heaped on ourselves while we were at Harvard Business School, we forgot what's important, but mostly we didn't give any thought to how we will measure our lives. What they all thought, and they admitted that those at the reunion said, we thought it was about the deals, the money, the possessions, came to find out that Clay Christensen finally concluded that the ones who succeeded the most, their definition of success was by the lives they touched and the communities they built nothing to do with the conventions of we're going to go out there and become billionaires. This book had a profound effect on me because as I read it, I said, my goodness, there's someone out there that stayed true to his principles and provided guideposts for these masters of the universe who think the world is going to go this way. Mm -hmm. And they find out this is not the mountain that I expected and completely fall below expectations and or go to jail. Even worse, that was his biggest surprise. How could these wow. Harvard MBAs get caught up? And so what are your objectives? Stay out of jail. That's an objective. Stay out of jail. Really? <laughs> but it, it hit him like a lightning bolt. What are we doing? Well, I, I think, though, and uh, I don't know if you would agree with this or not. I think a lot of that happens um, because a lot of people, they want to be successful, but they haven't yet defined what success is to them. Indeed. You can't go to what you can't get what you want unless you know what you want. Now, if, if I hop on a plane in Florida and I'm going to, and if I'm going to come visit you in New York, I'm going to go visit, I'm going to hit a plane that's going to be flying to New York city. Right. I'm not just going to get on a plane and just hoping it stops there. Right. Well, he, I want to know, point, I want to know where I'm going. No question. And, well, his point is at the, at, at the graduation, they didn't ask themselves those questions. They simply took their diplomas and went running to your point and what he tried to do in his classes, which is why he, he wrote the book before you get out of here, let's do what it is we did not do. Let's yeah. figure out, to your point, what's our destination? And even if you don't know it, at some point, you've got to make up your mind what it is you're, you're fighting for. Because if, you're, if you forget what, why you're doing what you're doing, you're going to end up somewhere else, which is jail, estrangement, divorce, all those things that happen. And unfortunately, they're nor many of them are normal, but his cases were so extreme. Wow. People who just... They, they forgot their relationships. They didn't pay attention to their kids. They were busy chasing the mountain of success and they fell to temptation. You know, I just, he, it was just a wonderful narrative, but I think you don't need That's to. That's amazing. I, I've got to, I've got to read this book. Check it out, but you don't I've, have to I've be a Harvard this. graduate. I certainly wasn't. I went to Syracuse and it was a good place, but I, I, you don't have to be in the Ivy league and they don't have a monopoly on success. 
to your point, look at those guys that at 18, you didn't have great expectations. They eventually figured it out and they decided what success was and they chased it. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, a lot of people, uh, you know, I think, uh, I didn't go to an Ivy league school. I went, I went to Emory university, which yeah, is good place. up there. Yeah. It's a good, good place. Yeah. But the, uh, the thing is a lot of people, like I, there were people in my fraternity that were going to go to law school because their dad was a lawyer and their granddad was a lawyer. So a lot of people are, are, are a lot of kids are pursuing whatever dreams that their families have for them, never questioning what are defining for themselves, what they want to do, what success looks like to them. They're just too afraid of disappointing the family or disappointing you know, other people. And instead of going after what they really want um, and uh, in my own business, I, I'm in the insurance business. I, I've seen this happen. And I have seen some of my agents go to jail for doing very stupid things uh, that, you know, just, just, you know, I, I tell, I tell people all the time, having an insurance license is a license to rob people without a gun legally. Why, 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 why on earth would you, would you commit fraud <laughs> or forgery or whatever? Just, just to, to do stupid stuff, just to meet the expectation of, of other people. And, and the expectations that, that they were trying to meet, the ones that I talked to, were, were just asinine and stupid. Yeah, well, I think often, I think that that's for, I, th I bear a responsibility that I take from the inspiration of Clay Christensen, from working with guys like you. You know, we, we, we experience is a name we give to our mistakes. So we, we can't go back, but what we can do is help that 25 year old, which is why I teach graduate school. I want them to know what nobody bothered to teach me. And I had a good dad, a great, great dad, good mentor, but there were a lot of things that were unsaid because I didn't look up to my dad to say, how am I going to get to Wall Street? He wouldn't have had a clue. So I think what we can do is help those mid coming out of college, help them to ask themselves the questions to set their own expectation separate from any social validation. Get off of Instagram, stop all the ridiculous social media where you're comparing yourself to everyone else. Compare and none of it's real. None of it's real anyway. None you know, it's, it's the real. 1%. 1% every day, just try to do a little bit better, but unfortunately, um, it, it's not that simple. But I think we, as these leaders, that we've got a modicum of success, there's something. We're not here to tell our war stories. We are here to help others understand. There are questions you can ask yourselves to determine what do you want to be in the world? And that's the Carl Jung quote, not what happened to me, what I choose to become. And sadly, Jeff, some people feel they need permission to actually have the freedom to decide. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, my students, I look around, I don't see any signs telling you no exit, don't go here, don't do that. <laughs> it's your life, you get to decide it. But if you decide it based on someone else's expectations, you're not living your life, you're living someone else's and that's jail. Oh, uh, absolutely it is. Well, let me ask you something in all the, uh, you know, you've been all over the world. I've been all over the world. Um, I, I haven't done the mountain climbing that you've done, but you, I, I'm you've climbed your curious. own mountains. I'm, I've climbed my own mountains, but <laughs> you've climbed plenty of mountains. They were probably harder than mine, <laughs> but I, I'm really curious though. What, what was the biggest, Oh shit moment that you ever had in your mountain climbing? Yeah, there were two actually. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll point to, to the top one. I climbed a mountain in Russia called Mount Elbrus. It's in the Caucasus Mountains. And Russia, people don't think of it geographically necessarily as Europe, but it is. It's, some, it's Eurasia. It's somewhere between Europe and Asia. And each of the seven continents of the world have a highest peak, and they're called the Seven Summits. So Africa's tallest mountain is Kilimanjaro. I climbed that seven summit. Himalayas, the tallest mountain is Mount Everest. That's the seven summit. Europe's seven summit is called Mount Elbrus in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. As a reference for our listeners, the Olympics many years ago was at Sochi, a place called Sochi in mm -hmm. the, Russia. It's near there. It's a couple hundred miles. It's in that mountain range. 
we were climbing Mount Elbrus and it's 18,500 feet elevation. Wow. Lovely, beautiful mountain. And it took us 11 days to get to the top. We finally, and it was a really cool team of Americans, Canadians, South Africans, and Australians. So it was nine of us. We had a ball. We had a lot of help along the way. We made it on the 11th day to the summit. Summit was beautiful, beautiful, sunny day. Jeff, we're now walking down the mountain. We're ascending. And it, we, you can do the ascent in one day. It's a very long day, but you can get to what's called base camp. And from base camp, we have the ability to get ourselves out of there. 11 days to the top, a full day to the bottom. We were on the descent. And normally, in, and this is a big glacier, you're clipped into your mountain team most of the time. So that way, if anybody falls, you are now being braced by your mates. So if you fall, there's a protocol, your mates will take you on the rope, they will pull it, and they will keep you from falling. Wow. Okay. We were at a, at a certain place at 17,000 feet on the descent where we decided to disconnect. We didn't see the need to be all connected any longer. The treacherous part of the mountains were behind us. We are now disconnecting from the harnesses. We, we are together by a harness and something called a, 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 a carabiner. We disconnected the carabiners. I'm now on my own. You with me so far? I am. I'm taking steps down the mountain, and this was after I was tired. It was, it was, it was, it was glorious in, 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 in the weather. My crampon, I was on a mountain ridge, and my crampon hit a piece of exposed granite. At that particular point, when I hit that granite, I spilled off the side of the mountain and started tearing down the mountain. So I fell off of Mount El El Elbrus, coming down the mountain off the side of the mountain pretty quickly. Oh, wow. Right. In mountaineering, you're, you're trained for these inevitabilities, kind of like a parachuter. If the first chute doesn't open, you've got a rip cord. You've got a, you've got a safety net. Well, in mountaineering, you, are, you have your best tools are your ice axe, which you hold in one hand, and the crampons, which are the teeth at the bottom of your boots that grip onto the ice. When you are falling and your muscle memory kicks in, you're, I'm falling off the mountain, speedily heading down off this side. I take my ice axe, I smash it into the mountain. I take my crampons, I smash them into the mountain. I'm now fixed on the mountain far from my team, holding on for dear life that I don't fall any further. Wow. I'm now, oh, it was brutal. I'm gripped onto the mountain and say, all right, let me just stay calm. That's what you do as mountaineers. You're trained to just be in the moment, look at your entrance, your exits, understand where you are in time and space, and then figure out how you're going to communicate your way out of there. Fortunately, I was in earshot from the team, and the team saw me. They, they had a visual on me, and they screamed, Chuck, are you okay? Yes. Hold on. We're going to come to get you. So the team of, of 11 other people were all connected to each other. What I saw as I was gripped onto the mountain as tight as I can, I saw my guide being lowered coming at me. And his name was Mark, Mark Reifelberg. I will never forget him for what he just did. He comes down off of that mountain and he is being lowered by his team. And I see him sliding down and he comes right next to me. So we're now face to face. The first thing he did, he took his carabiner. He was clipped into the team up above who anchored him. He took his carabiner. He clipped it into my harness. I'm now anchored to him. Wow. He is anchored to 11 people up above. We are now in a safe zone. What we have to do is get back now and climb, and we're trained to do to vertically climb ourselves back up to that ridge. However, something happened in that moment where I was more, I was safe, I was fine, I wasn't hurt. I think I was more embarrassed than anything else, and I was quickly getting myself ready to, to ascend. And Mark said, Chuck, hold on. He said, I want you to look up at that. And it was a beautiful sunny day. The sun had rose about four hours earlier. He said, hold on, look around, take a look. Look at that sun, look at that blue sky. Think about your family. Think about the people who loved you. And he had a big smile on his face. He was not stressed, he was not anxious. He was totally grace under fire. Wow. I'm gripping onto the mountain. And he's talking about love. He's talking about gratitude. 
look how lucky we are. It was the most emotionally intelligent leadership moment in the history of my life. Wow. I'm trying to figure out how we get back to the ridge. And he created a safe space. Chuck, you're good. We're together here. Look how lucky we are. Look at the sun, the sky. You got a team of 11 people up there that love you, man. Relax. Wow. We're good. He smiled all through, just making me calm and peaceful. And it's like my whole, my breath changed, my body posture changed. I was relaxed because physically we were clipped in. We had a couple thousand pounds of force that was going to help us up the mountain. And this is what he's talking about. What a wonderful leader. You can't put that in a textbook. It, it, it Absolutely was just, not. It, it was this, this is a leader. Now, this guy, I don't know what he went to college. I, I, it didn't matter. This was the brilliance. This is what Larry would have done as a four-star general because he has that vibe. You know, th this was my moment where this is what leadership is, creating the safe space for your people, being, being calm under pressure and great expectations and knowing we're all in it together. So there's a protocol in mountaineering, Chuck, climb on. I start climbing. I said, and I say climbing. He says, climbing back. That's the language that we speak, that we communicate in, in our movements. And right. here we were, he and I were climbing together in parallel. We were heading up there and the, all my mates were up above high-fiving me, Chuck, you okay? Yeah, 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 thank you very much. I dusted off. It was a five second moment. All good. Everybody's good with big bear hug, big high five. Let's go home. And, and, and never talked about it is just all good. Just another wow. day on the, in the mountain office. But Jeff, that was my, I will never, I will take that with me every moment of ever, wherever I go, whatever I do. Mark Reifelberg, you are in my heart for, for what you showed me a, 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 a great leader is. That was my mountain moment that in seven expeditions, that one moment was a defining leadership moment for how the benchmark for how leaders behave. And also too, I would think that at that moment, the biggest thing Mark gave you, he gave you certainty in your uncertain world at that time. No doubt, man. He, That's the rarest anybody, commodity on earth. Oh man. Anybody that has the gift to be able to give that, they're, they're, that's a bear hug, just knowing you're with mother, father, bear, whatever that may be, and you are protected from the elements, and I'm here to protect you. I think that moment, Jeff, was, was inspired me to wake up every day, and it was then and there. That's when I knew I was going to leave Wall Street, start my own executive coaching. I didn't think I was going to end up Columbia, but what a joy it is to be able to inspire my students, because I, I know as a teacher, I had a lot of bad ones, and the bad ones just talk, the great ones inspire. And I, I strive every day to be the great one, to help them to see beyond their own limits, to dream beyond their own limits and see the endless possibilities if they only have the courage to decide what they want to be. So that moment, Jeff, is it's priceless. I, I can what, never pay that back. All I can do is pay it forward. The moment I have, and I, I actually say this to myself every day, a few years ago, I um you know, I, I eat really well, exercise, do it, do everything right. Uh, I'm at a Bucks game, sitting up in a luxury suite, and you know, you know, they got cheeseburgers and all that. And I ate one. <laughs> I, th I thought I thought I had indigestion. Turns out I had a I had a blockage in my artery. Oh boy! And I didn't have a heart attack, thank God. But but I went to the hospital, and I wasn't scared. I was so mad. I was mad that this happened. I was, I was like, you know, I got things I got to do. I, you know, I just got married. I just, I just bought a new boat. I just <laughs> I got a lot stuff. to live for. I, I'm not and ready I to go. I got a lot to live for. And, <laughs> and the doctor comes in and, and he, he says, well, you're going to need to start doing this and that. And I said, look, I don't need you to tell me what I need to do. I need you to fix it. And, and <laughs> I, was, you know, I, I was cursing at him. <laughs> he point. grabs my hand. I'll never forget this. He grabs my hand and he says, relax, 
you're already dead. Whoa. I went, oh, shit. Wow, that is heavy. What'd you do with that? I asked him, I went, I went, ooh, okay. And then they knocked me out. So he came back and he came back to see me the next day. Right. And I'm like, why did you say that to me? Yeah. He says, you need to say that to yourself every day that you live. Ah, I was wondering, where is he going with this? To say he says, wow. Everything in the past doesn't matter. Right. The future doesn't matter. What matters is now. Right. Your presence. You're right. What here. matters right. is now. And I swear, Chuck, if I'm out walking my dog, and, and 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 if I have crazy things going on in my head, you know, problems or or whatever, if I say that to myself, it goes away. It's like the air smells fresher. You can you can hear birds. You can do all this stuff because all you're guaranteed is here and now you're not guaranteed anything past this and what That's you did point. before doesn't matter you can't do anything about it you can't change it yeah yeah and i, I teach that in emotional intelligence to my students i, I teach them self-talk you know what what is the conversation you have with yourself yeah. because many people opposite to what you're describing, Jeff, are people that have self-conversations of destruction, self-destruction. I'm not good enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. Okay. If that's the conversation you have with yourself, it becomes self-fulfilling. After a while, you begin to believe it. And then you begin to yeah. act that way and you end up in jail or whatever that may be. Right. To your point, to those that believe and it doesn't have to be a faith in God or whatever spirit you believe exists, but having a faith that you can try and you can get through this, but you're guaranteed not to get through it if you self-destruct. That's right. And, I love that. Wow. That's really the way the dead. way that I feel lots of times when I say that is if you can remember back in the day when you're in elementary school, it's your last day of school. You got the summer out. And you can do no wrong that day because <laughs> it doesn't matter because tomorrow I'm free. It's the same thing. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here. It doesn't matter. And, 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 and for me, it has, it has just literally exploded previous limitations that I had for myself. Just reminded myself of that. Do you remember your doctor's name? Uh. Actually, I don't. No, just just that's why I wanted to. I, I keep reminding myself of Mark, my mountain guide. In my moment, you had a moment, oh, and I'll never I'll forget. I'm going to relate that because this is a yeah. gift. This is a gift the doctor gave you. Mark, I'll have to. I'll have to find out. And I'll, I'll get it. Get it, get you his name. Send him. Let's send him a gift. You know. Let, oh, I did. Up, right. Right. Exactly. We're good. Yeah. I, I sent yeah, I Mark did. a gift. Um, they gave us a gift. The law of reciprocity says you give to give back in, e yes. in equal or or better measure. And I think that's what we do, Jeff, is as all the people of your insurance business, you have a lot of people that count on you. They look up to you, but they need your guidance, your instruction, your discipline, but your inspiration, because they're now living their story as dictated by the conversation they have with themselves. And that's a book I use called Live the Best Story of Your Life by my friend named Bob Litwin, who's a, the senior U.S. Davis Cup champion on the U.S. tennis team. And his book, Live the Best Story of Your Life, very much addresses that about be here today, be somewhere else tomorrow. The yeah. 20 seconds of what happens between points and tennis. What do you do in that 20 seconds when you've either had a point or had a point against you? You've got 20 seconds to figure out what do you want that next point to be because you're in charge and that's he uses that metaphor but it's another thing like with you we 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 are each other's teachers where we we learn from each other what kind of self-talk in order to improve our lives to make it better or just to get through the stuff we're dealing with which is sometimes tough there's so much self-talk and self-belief has so much to do with it I was, I was talking to a physician the other day. My wife's a doctor, so I right. know lots of doctors. Yeah. And she was saying that it takes, for the FDA to approve a drug, 
it has to be 90% effective. Right. The problem with that, though, is placebo is effective 87% of the time. <laughs> right. Something close to 90, <laughs> right? Well, way to go. <laughs> so what does that tell us? And what does that tell you? Yeah. Our mind is right 80%, 87% of the time. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, placebo's effective 87% of the time, and it takes 90% okay. for the drug to be approved. I'm like in the placebo. I'm willing to. I'm willing to forgo the three percent if I don't have to take a chemical. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll try know. to will myself to good health. And I'm, I'm very fortunate, like you. I'm a very healthy. I, I dealt with obesity when I was a teenager, and I lost sixty pounds when I was a sophomore in high school. That was the best gift. The second, maybe, maybe the best gift I ever had, because it was the first gift I had. Where, where I was heading into adulthood and I realized how lucky I was to have been bullied on the playground because I was the fat kid and I hated it at the time and couldn't get a date and no one looked at me. In fact, the, the guys just treated me. I was fat man, fat boy. I had every nickname in, in, in the book and, and that whittled at my self-esteem until one day I made up my mind with my dad. My dad was my you know, conciliator, conciliator counselor, dad, best friend, whatever it may be. He helped and guided me through my six-pound weight loss, and I never brought it back. But it was, it was, I learned more about human nature from what happened in that metamorphosis than I did in any other time in my life, because you begin to see how people act and react to who you are. And in that case, it wasn't who I was. It was this thing I was that people thought they could make fun of. And, and so I know what it's like to be in that because I was there. But also, and while I thank my dad in heaven for helping me, my dad helped me to take control of my life, that if I want that pain to stop, the world isn't going to change. I need to change. So Exactly. And I think my, my calling to, to my students, people that I work with, is the Rumi quote, yesterday I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. And I think that's what school to your four-year-old grandson, who's going to help him to change himself? Nobody. They're going to give him biology and algebra, and that's all good, but they're just going to ask him to cram do an exam. Who's helping him find himself? That's you, grandpa. Yeah. And, in, and plus, the, you know, his, his classmates, you know, little kids are the meanest little shits in the world. Yes, they are. They're terrible. They're oh, no doubt. Oh, they're I, awful. They're awful. And they're <laughs> boys, girls, they're, there's no monopoly either way. People are cruel. And, and we have to learn to deal with that cruelty because it's real. We can't go on Twitter and say, you know, you offended me. <laughs> no, no, no. no <laughs> Find no. another way. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. I, I, was, um, I was walking uh, in this park back behind me that uh, it's like a, a swamp. But it's elevated. Then there's a big playground there. And there's this little kid minding his own business. He's probably five years old, minding his own business, playing with a little toy dump truck. And here comes this other little kid and just takes the toy away. And his mother, instead of taking up for the kid, says, Ethan, you need to learn to share. And I'm thinking, what, what bullshit is that? What if I go hop in her Volvo and take off and go home? She needs to learn to share. Hey, she I'm liking to share. Car. Sure, you can hear the keys. Yeah, that's just that's just bad parenting, Jeff. And I, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of patience for that. It's, it's terrible. Well, Chuck, know, it, it, man, I, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. It, oh, lots of great that. info. Yeah. Love stories. And, and, it, and it just, so much of what you said just hits home to me. I appreciate that. And, and if people want to find you, how do they, how do they find you? you? You bet. Well, you can always go to my website. And if you remember my name, Chuck Garcia, all you'd have to do is add a dot com to it. So you can go to chuckgarcia.com. My company is called Klein Leadership. You can always email me at chuck at kleinleadership.com, but it's also on the Chuck Garcia tab. Really appreciate Jeff. Yeah, coming thank on you. Your show and and you have a know, podcast. I do. It's called a climb to the top. Right now, I am in a bit of a, of a lull only because we had a television show. My friends at Two Market Media produced a television show called A Climb to the Top. We, we, it's, it's a pilot. And oh, we, wow. I can't wait I, to see that. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you after this the teaser. It's a three minute 
teaser. They are now shopping it to NBC and Discovery and all the streaming wow. networks. So take a look at the teaser. It's called The Climb to the Top. It's an open casting call. We had four people who came with us on a mountain expedition in the Adirondacks. Wow. This was not just about mountain climbing. That's just the, 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 the look of it. The concept of the show is undercover boss meets amazing race up the mountain. So we were on a mountain in the Adirondacks and really the template of the story was everybody writing their old story, coming to the mountain bonfire. We sat around on a bonfire Friday night for three hours. Everybody related their story, their old story, struggles, limitations, challenges, hardships. We wanted all of it and they were very powerful and vulnerable. We dropped their old stories into the bonfire as we incinerated that old story. The next morning, as the sun comes up, the crew, film crew, 14 people, phenomenal. Three camera operators, drone, booms, oh, we're on that mountain really early in the morning. Sun is coming up. Now is the opportunity to write your new story. That's what amazing. What do you want your life to look like? I am there to help you. So I've, I've, I've taken, just due to competing interest, I've slowed down the podcast as we're focusing on trying to get our show sold. So stay tuned, Jeff. I'll email it to you right after the show. But to our listeners, to all the Jeff's listeners, thank you for listening. And but I hope you'll you'll see a climb to the top on television. And I think I, I'm quite sh- quite sure we will. Yeah, Hank Hank and Hopefully. Steve are killers. They're going to get you on TV, hey. buddy. <laughs> they were doing that. I love, I love those guys. But they, they've been they've been great to work with because they saw the vision of my desire and how I want to bring a climb to the top in the service of others. That's what this is. It, it, we're, we're, we're humble servants, Jeff. We are here to help them figure out another way when when all the things they did weren't working, maybe our approach will work for them. And that's that's what we hope. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Chuck Garcia, thanks so much for being on. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was uh-huh. a pleasure.